From salami and eggs to smoked salmon wrapped goat cheese. From chicken soup and matzo balls to striped bass in a horseradish crust. From beef borscht to brisket with couscous, apricots, and prunes. That's Jewish cooking in America. Everybody has a favorite Jewish dish. Dora Salganik could live on her gefilte fish. Fred Loeb would like to eat challah seven days a week. And June Salander could skip everything else and go straight for her strudel. For me and my family, it's kugel. In the old world, kugels were made with little more than noodles or potatoes. Nowadays, in this land of milk and honey, Kugels are most often sweet and enriched with eggs, sour cream, or cottage cheese. Kugel has become decidedly American, laced with Yankee ingredients like sweet corn and pecans. My family's favorite kugel is nothing fancy, but noted cookbook author Sheila Lukens wanted to see just how it is done. Sheila, thanks for coming over today to make one of my favorite dishes, kugel. I wouldn't miss your noodles for anything, Joan. <laughs> we'll work together, right? You bet. Is this like what your mother made? Yes, kugel? yes. I love that kugel, especially the edge. You know where it gets nice and crusty? Crusty, definitely. I, I didn't realize some people like to pick off the top crust of I'm the kugel. I'm one of those You're people. Of those I people. can't wait. Anyway, so shall we cook a kugel? Yes. And this, of course, is a very American kugel. A kugel Origin, you know how it originated, don't you? You tell me. All right. <laughs> and see if I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, kugel in Europe, they're potato kugel or noodle kugel, and of course they weren't machine-made noodles, they were noodles that were cut and made by hand. And it was the dish that went along with the cholent, the overnight stew, in the oven for Shabbat. And it was something that was cooked a long time, and very often it was made in a flower pot-shaped pan. Oh. That was oh. higher on the top. There was a, a central oven that people would go to. They'd bring the cholent and they'd bring the, the, the kugel. And my guess is it was high because you didn't have the kind of space that a, a flat pan would take, different kind of oven. Oh, no, this I did not know, so I love this story. Well, anyway, so that's what it was. And of course, kugel in Europe it was not the sweetness that we have. They were lucky if they had either cottage cheese or, I think this basically is a, the American kugel with cottage cheese and sour cream is based on a Hungarian kugel. Uh -huh. A Hungarian noodle, I don't know if when you were doing your international cookbook, if you saw in Hungary there are noodles and cottage cheese and a little bit of sugar, which is really, you know, what's uh, kugel? That's right. So should we start? Yes, go ahead. First we're gonna boil some noodles. For about eight minutes. Okay, there Let's we are. Just... All right. Oh, I forgot to put a little bit of salt in. We've got oh, okay. Well, there always have to have some salt. salt. In. Don't you agree? Right, and you always have to stir. Right. Salt and stir. Okay. Okay. Well, should we mix what we're going to yes, put in let's here? Let's get it together. Okay. Cottage cheese. Do you use full fat or low fat? <sighs> Both. Depends okay. on who I, you know, you could okay. do this whole thing with either sour cream and regular cottage cheese, uh -huh. or you could use yogurt, plain yogurt and um, low-fat cottage cheese. Uh -huh. And most of the time, I would say, if you're going to do something, do it right. But in this particular case, people love kugel so much that you do this, at least in my house, very often. Uh -huh. And therefore, if, if you really think that people shouldn't have fat foods, then, you know, you can reduce it. Love that. Right. Milk, one and a half cups, and about a cup of sour cream. You Here. see, we only have this in my family at the holidays, uh -huh. probably at Rosh Hashanah. Right. And so we would go full out and just use all, you know, not low fat. What we do is we have a once a month Shabbat dinner with Awesome. Not at our house. I mean, we have Shabbat dinner every Friday night, but we have a potluck, a dairy potluck. And oh. there's always, oh my gosh. there are about 10 families that do it. That must be the best. It's the best. And I there bet. are always, the kids all want noodle kugel. That's, for them, that's heaven. Okay, we have three eggs. You put the butter in here? Right. How much butter? About a half a cup of butter. Melted? Yeah. Okay. 
And of course, you can probably reduce that if you want to as well. Let's it's get, looking good. Well, it's, you know, nice and rich. It certainly is. And then you put in about a half a cup of sugar. Oh, this looks gorgeous. I tell you, no matter how good you think yours is, when you see yours, Joan, oh, right. this is looking good. But it's good. just like your mom's, you said. Oh, I don't know, but this is looking great. <laughs> this has a few more things than my mother's. This is looking gorgeous. Well, That's no offense, mother. Actually, this original recipe came from a woman named Ruth Rab, whose husband was the American ambassador in Rome. Oh, and oh, she oh. served. She has four children, and she serves this recipe. And I had it actually at a potluck. That was the first time I had it. Cinnamon. cinnamon. How much of that? Well, looks I don't know. Great. It's a lot of cinnamon, so we're doing it a little less. About yes, a teaspoon. But, but that looks so beautiful. Oh, and I see you have cherries and apricots and almonds. How great! And you can either put them in or just sprinkle them in on top. I think I'll put half of them in and sprinkle half on top. How's that to make it look Beautiful. pretty at the end? Slivered almonds. You could put dried cherries. You could put I dried cranberries. Wouldn't those be good? Dried cranberries would be beautiful. I love dried cherries. I just really feel they're just about like the new raisins these days. Right. The apricots are gorgeous. You could cut them up. OK, so now we have to do is I think our noodles are ready. And here we have some great noodles. Let's toss it. All right, you want to let's throw them in here. Right, good idea. Right away when they're hot so they don't stick together, right? Exactly. And I love it that we put cinnamon in it because it <laughs> gives it an extra flavor. We'll put it right into this dish. OK. Voila. Ah, beautiful. There we go. There, and the dried fruits will add an extra special flavor. Here we go. Apricots. Love it. Now, of course, chances are that whoever was making this in Eastern Europe, if they were, might not have not had all these. Like that. Certainly not uh, prepared cottage cheese or prepared sour cream. They just got it in bulk. And But, you know, Madison Avenue has really changed recipes, especially kugel with pineapple kugel. And exactly. Well, okay. actually, don't you love that um, cottage cheese with pineapple in it? Oh, yeah. You know well, what? that's probably exactly. the same thing. <laughs> so and you bake it for at 350 for about 45 minutes to an hour till it cuts well. Uh -huh. And there we are. It's beautiful. So now let's put it in the oven, and uh, then we'll taste it. Oh, this looks great, Sheila. That looks so great. Oh, Joan, before you serve it, will you let me have one of the noodles? <laughs> the crispy noodles? Take it, take it, take oh, it God, off. Oh, God, I have to. It looks so good, even if I've destroyed the cookie. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is what I was waiting for. Is that what you grew up with? The crispy okay. noodle, right? Well, it's certainly what I've been waiting for today. <laughs> you want to have a, a taste of this, or just the crispy noodle? Well, the crispy noodle was great. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. It is so delicious. Let me taste That it. is so delicious. Mmm. Mmm. Historically, kugels were Sabbath dishes baked alongside the traditional Sabbath stew, chalant. Chalant was a humble, slow-simmered dish made with inexpensive cuts of meat, a few bones if they were available, and some beans or barley to fill out the hearty fare. Mark Straussman, chef at Campania in New York City, makes his chalant with short ribs. Short ribs have become trendy, but were once poor people's food. It's kind of funny when you talk about peasant cooking, it's just amazing that every country in Europe touches each other, mm -hmm. and so do their recipes. And, and this is one where most of the Jews in Italy are Sephardic, and this recipe has a lot of Sephardic overtones in it Absolutely. with honey in it. And, but it could also be very, very easily Eastern European Well, as this well. recipe, don't forget, chalant or hamim, which means warm, went all around the world. They can trace it to the fourth century AD. And uh, the reason that they had it was to keep the Sabbath, where you're not allowed to cook on the right. Sabbath. And so every Jew that was religious would do this so that they would have something warm after the Sabbath services for lunch. Well, yeah. when I was interviewing, I, you know, because I do a Passover in the restaurant, and I went to Rome and interviewed families. And uh, one of the families I interviewed was 
quite religious, and they were ver very big members of the Roman synagogue, which is probably one of the most famous synagogues right. in all of Italy. And I'm sure they had a dish just like this. And I'd imagine also the Italians would have used a, ver a variation of, you know, flanken or short ribs, or, or definitely a cut of meat that came from very close to this, and not a brisket, because a brisket couldn't stand up to overnight ah. cooking. It would just shred into nothing. That's why you use short ribs or flanken, because it, it, it's tough enough to stand up to overnight right. cooking. And the other thing that is very Italian is we put in, because in Asabuco, everybody loves the marrow. Yeah. You don't so, have to be Italian to love the marrow. Right, so, and this goes in, and what the marrow does is it adds uh, body to the, the dish. That's and, what it And does. makes it, because uh, of all of the proteins in the marrow and in the, bo and in the bone, it, gelatin comes from right. marrow. So you'll, you'll see that when you do it, and if it gets cold, then it becomes very gelatinous and very rich and thick. So even though it's a peasant dish, there's a lot of richness and flavor in it, and that's why you can also have a lot of tradition in it. Well, this is also the great make-ahead meal if you're going to have people for dinner. Right. And then there's this great presentation when you open it, um, and it's been cooking for eight hours. Yeah, and I, I find that when you, when you do a dinner party, you know, there's more to life than rack of lamb. Right. And being able to sit, you can't sit around a dinner table and talk about rack of lamb. Well, actually, it's the Jewish cassoulet, and I think we should get started. Definitely. Okay. Okay. Well, we're gonna you know, we're gonna do it very simply. Um, what we're gonna do is just simply layer it. Yeah. Put in one little one row of the short ribs. Of course, the salt, pepper, a little more salt. Then we're gonna put in the carrots. little onion, some of the beans, yeah. and a marrow. And in this recipe, like I said, I'm changing it just slightly. Put a little rosemary, and then again, and then, you know, all of the ingredients go in, the beans, and the wheat berries, huh? you know, which kind of help thicken it up. Put a little more onion in. In which is something they might have used in ancient Israel, too. Oh, totally. Bay leaf, another marrow bone, a little more rosemary. And actually, all of these ingredients, yeah, the honey. honey. Ooh. Keep it nice and sweet. All right. And then the potato. And we'll be ready. I have some chicken stock right over here. Uh, a lot of recipes, lots of times they use water. Just to cover it. Right. Just covers it. And then one last thing. You know, so I told you this whole aphrodisiac thing has got me going here, so I can't stop now using garlic. I just walk around with it in my pocket these right. days. <laughs> oh, now that's a good way of doing it. Yeah. Is this the way that you... Yeah. Why do you do this rather than um, put them in individual clothes? Well, you know, it's, it's supposed to cook for a long time. Right. So, you know, here it'll hold together and it won't dissipate. So, you know, lots of times when we make stocks, we slice it that way and we just put it in. You know, if Woody Allen gets a hold of that, he's going to make a movie over yeah. here about garlic, and then that'll be it. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to cover it, okay. and we're just going to let it simmer for a little while, and then once it's simmering nicely, we'll put it in the oven, and then we'll come back tomorrow afternoon, and hopefully it'll be ready. Great. Well, let's come back tomorrow afternoon and eat it. I got it. Okay. So, this has been in the oven for about, what, how many hours? A lot. Well, at a least eight hours, hours it's going to be now. Okay, so let's see what this tastes like. Okay. You see that the meat has fallen just apart slightly off of the bone a little bit because, you know, once something has been in the oven over eight hours, no matter what kind of oven it is, that happens. But it, it just, it's really oh, it wonderful. So and you see the way the beans right. have, and the 
wheat berries has thickened up along with the marrow. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get some out. Actually, what's so interesting about this dish is it, it takes on the color of wherever you're from. So right. here you're into Italian cooking and you've never made this before, but what you're doing is you're making an Italian version of it. And right. Jews that live in India use Indian spices. They're vegetarian chants. They're even chant cook-offs in different cities in the United States today. Oh. And you know, there's Hungarian with different kinds of beans, different kinds of spices. Got it. There's a lot. There oh, that's, wow, that's, looks beautiful. Let's take a little bit of the sauce, and here's the marrow bone. There it is. Some of the marrow on top. And here's another piece of meat. Oh, this so. is all the short ribs, right? Right, these are all short ribs. Bigger short ribs. Well, you know, we used one. Here's another one. Okay. Okay. Mm, it smells so good. <laughs> When I was making this, all of my staff said, you know, you have to make a lot because uh, even though they're not peasants, it looked kind of good to them too. Yeah. And there you see is one of the rib, the bones. So I'm gonna just very gently pour this over. Huh? And oh, it smells so good. And there we go. Chalant, food for the gods. It is a far cry from the kugels that were served with chalant to the lick your fingers kugel. Susan Shovers is an organizer of the Hadassah Kugel Fair held every year in Evansville, Indiana. I'm going to make um, the lick your fingers kugel, which came out of uh, the North Shore Chicago Hadassah cookbook right. in the 70s. And this cookbook was my Bible for a while, and this was the kugel that I liked the best. First of all, let's start boiling noodles. And we're going to boil these for about um, eight minutes or so. OK. All right. And then we're going, we've melted. I've melted two sticks of butter. Mm -hmm. And I always cook with unsalted butter. I don't know about so you, but that's all there is in my repertoire. Okay. And I'm going to pour in, oh, about uh, a third of it. OK. And I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of brown sugar, and you can certainly add more or less. So this, in a sense, is a a schneckenkugel. Yeah, it's a sweet kugel. And, and you can actually, I put this out when I've used, um, you know, I put it out with desserts, and sort of pack it down a little bit into the butter. Well, you know, this recipe more than any other kugel recipe I've ever heard of keeps popping up. People from Chicago say to me, oh, well, there's one kugel you don't know about. This is it. And I said, look I at the book. I didn't know that. I didn't, I I didn't realize it was that popular. Very popular. I thought it was my own favorite one. But now I'm going to put into this, put on here. And again, you can use more or less. I happen to like lots. Cons. Yeah. Yeah. OK. I'll make lots. We'll finish this. Usually, I use my fingers, but well, you can use I'm going to be a little neater to this. <laughs> okay. Just pack that in here. OK. OK. And then set it aside. Now, I'm going to do four eggs. Yeah. And I've also, when I've made this, increased this to, uh, I've done five eggs, mm -hmm. depending on the size of the egg. So this kugel you could serve as a an accompaniment or a dessert, right? Either one. I'm going to add to that a half a cup of white, a regular sugar, a teaspoon of cinnamon, and two teaspoons of salt. And I'm going to mix it. It's a little too much cinnamon. OK. If there are any secrets to a good kugel, don't you think that one of them is more eggs, even though everybody wants to cut down on eggs, or more? Or, if or more a, butter. Or cream cheese, or, or sour cream, I or agree. whatever. So it's a little more liquid. Right. OK. OK. I think that's, that will do. Let's put the butter into this, too. OK. OK. I almost forgot that. Yeah. 
keep stirring. I think this is an easy kulu. Okay. And there's that. This is a great brunch it dish because it makes a nice presentation. Of course, original kugels were either potato or noodle, and they were an accompaniment to the Sabbath dish, right? Right. And so they would be cooking alongside the overnight stew. And I suppose if you use parver margarine, you can use this. Oh. Can you use this either way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Very easy. Isn't that easy? Easy, easy. Okay. And then let's just... We're going to bake that for an hour and 15 minutes or until it's really brown on top. At what degree? 350. Oven? Okay. How do we know that this is done? Can you smell it? I, sh I can smell your whole house. Yeah, the cinnamon. I mean, I yeah. just think of your house as a house full of baked goods. It is. With it a is. lemon cake. Uh, and every freezer is full. Okay, let's see if it's done. I mean, let, let's, let's undo it. Okay, so we've taken this out of the oven. I've, we've let this cool for about 20 minutes. It has to come away from the sides of the pan. Mm -hmm. Then you know that it's, it's ready. And all we do, like anything else, is flip it. And voila, there we are. Oh, it looks beautiful. Isn't that nice? Just beautiful. It is really a, not lick your fingers kugel, but it's really a well, schnecken Well, it is a lick kugel. your fingers kugel because I'm fixing the And pecan. this is all sticky. It's all sticky. And it probably okay. should be, it can be eaten at room temperature, but it probably should be reheated a little bit before serving it. Can we taste it? Let's taste it. Okay. You have, you have the honor. You cut. I have the honor. Yes. All right. So this one you could, I think this is a great brunch dish. You know, to have this as a centerpiece, or as a dessert, or I sometimes even serve this with brisket. Do you know what else? You can make this in any kind of a mold also, which I think is very nice, uh, or in just a regular blend pan. Mm -hmm. So you can make them in shapes, but it works best with a flat bottom pan. Why? Because of the... Because of the topping. Okay. Here. Okay. Bete avon. Bete avon. This looks wonderful. Mm -hmm. When I think back to the Jewish immigrants who have come to America, I am always amazed at how they have adapted. And I realize what's best about Jewish cooking in America are the wonderful people who cook and the rich stories they tell. For me, Preserving these stories and the tastes they evoke is the very best way to pass on the Jewish heritage to future generations. To learn more about Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan, visit us online at www.pbs.org. Companion products for Jewish cooking in America, including Joan Nathan's updated cookbook, a CD of the music score, and a two-hour video of series highlights and recipes, are available by calling 1-800-235-3000. Credit cards are accepted. Jewish cooking in America with Joan Nathan is made possible by the Joseph S. and Diane H. Steinberg Charitable Trust, proud supporters of the arts, children's causes, and the preservation of Jewish heritage and by Hebrew National, proud sponsors of Jewish Cooking in America, serving you and your family traditional kosher franks and delicatessen products since 1905. Hebrew National, we answer to a higher authority. And by Lenders Bagels. Our idea of a perfect day is warm and comforting and satisfying all around. Lenders Bagels the perfect circle and by the following private individuals and family foundations
This has been a co-production of Joan Nathan, Frappe Productions, and Maryland Public Television. This is PBS.